a little bit about Sanford. Our mission is to support the nonprofit sector by offering fundraising training to working professionals in that sector for free or low cost. Yes, I did say that, free or low cost. And that comes from the mandate of our fund, our funder, our patron, who is a gentleman in San Diego that saw that the nonprofit sector was in need of support. I, the, the, the story is, is that he was tired of being asked badly um, to give money, and so he wanted to provide some kind of way that fundraisers could learn how to do it right. So he funded several of the institutes, which are all over the country, all over the United States. And this is Seattle's. I manage it. I direct it. And we have a series of workshops, seminars, webinars across the year. Um, today we're talking about, give, or not about Give Big, I beg your pardon, we're talking about Giving Days. Uh, the impetus behind this was knowing that people, hopefully, you are starting to think about give, Giving Days, especially Give to, or Tuesday. Tuesday. What the heck is yeah. the matter with me today? Giving, giving Tuesday, which is going to be here before we know it. And having been connected with one of the preeminent experts in giving days in our region, Megan Hall, I reached out after her to join us, and I'm very thankful that she said yes. So with no further ado, Megan Hall, arts fundraiser and all-around fabulous expert in the topic of giving days. All right, thank you. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate to have you here. Um, I think that one of the reasons I was asked to do this was because uh, the Seattle Symphony, where I've worked for the last six years, have had, has had such success with their giving day, particularly with Give Big um, here locally. Um, it was a campaign that started as all digital about seven years ago, and in five years we were able to grow the campaign fivefold. And so that really catches your attention, because typically we're, we're pretty happy with a 5 to 15% growth year over year. We feel like that looks good. This is, this is going well. And um, with our giving day, we were able to really significantly increase um, the supporter base and uh, the revenue for the organization. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say, too, that if you have questions as we go along or additional ideas to add to the conversation, um, please, please join me. So um, for our agenda today, uh, we're going to talk about what giving days are and some examples of them. Uh, some of the benefits and unique opportunities that I think that they offer to fundraisers. Uh, we should also talk about deciding whether to participate in one or not. They're, all, they're not always right for you and your organization. Um, and then we'll talk about planning and communications and some sample communication plans that you could use for your giving day. Um, so, uh, what is a giving day? Um, I would define it as a focused day of philanthropy where you invite, you're inviting people who typically are just making gifts online, on the phone, by mail, um, really an event to really be a part of so that you're bringing a community of like-minded people together to support your organization. Um, you could have a giving day that's just for your organization. I think that that is most common in higher education. We see that as a really popular um, mechanism for engaging alumni and current students. Um, you could have your local uh, giving day, which for us is definitely Give Big in Seattle. Um, I pulled in North Texas Giving Day because that is the largest giving day apparently in the nation, and it's been going on for years. I moved here from there seven years ago, and it was going on for well before that. And then, of course, you have international giving days. And so uh, Giving Tuesday is my example of that. It started in New York City, but uh, that quickly became an international giving day and is coming up for us in a few months. Um, but you can also create giving days out of other sort of holidays. So Earth Day, for example, if you are a um, environmental conservation organization, it would be a great opportunity to consider fundraising on Earth Day. Or you have National um, National Parks Day it would be great for someone like Washington Trails. Uh, so I got that appeal recently. Um, and so there are all sorts of different holidays, back to school, um, things where you can t take a theme that people already recognize, some kind of concept that's simple to them, and you can actually create a giving day out of it because it's already, it requires less explaining. It's more intuitive to donors. So um, why donors love giving days? I thought we would start with the donor because I think um, they're just super important to everything we do. They are our work. 
Um, so in my experience, I have found that donors absolutely enjoy giving days because you're giving someone who typically goes online and makes a $25 gift with little fanfare, you're giving them an opportunity to be a uh, part of something that's much larger. And so suddenly that $25 gift is part of a community and they can invite their friends to be part of it. They don't have to explain why because it's already something that's going on in your community and with people that um, care about you. So I definitely, um, that was just one of the things that was really evident at the symphony was that this felt like the least or the most frictionless kind of offer we could make to say, hey, would you be part of this with us? And I think it's because it is part of something larger. Um, so sort of in tandem, it feels really good. There's a lot more public recognition of the impact. So you have a lot of charities saying, hey, thank you, give big donors, give big donors, look at what you did. Um, and you can talk about them collectively because it actually happened in a short enough time period that it is sort of a cohesive group at that point. Otherwise, the donations are just kind of coming in day by day, week by week, and you don't have a sort of a unit out of that donor group. Um, so they become part of a part of a pack. Um, it, it's oftentimes a pretty easy way to support, um, partially because you are getting their attention through collective messaging. So they can, you know, and maybe you have a shared platform, you can go and make your 10 different gifts to the organizations you care about. Um, and it's, it's a pretty nice, easy experience for them. And then one of the other things I think that is kind of interesting and unique about Giving Days uh, for the donor is that it might cause them to think about their larger picture of philanthropy, um, which I think is a little bit unique. Um, with, like, say, pre-Giving Days, I think that calendar year ends might be one of the only other times when most charities are asking for support. That's a really important time for us. And so if you're a donor and you're receiving maybe five or 12 or 20 different appeals in the mail, that probably makes you stop to think about who you are and what you care about and what you want to support. And I think giving days are a similar opportunity where you do have you know, some level of cap on your funds and you need to think about what's most important to me. So I think it's kind of an interesting opportunity for them. Um, on the nonprofit side, uh, it's, there are many reasons. So uh, it, it provides really important funding for our mission, or it has the potential to. Um, the return on investment is one of the biggest things that sort of um, really caught my attention, is that if I send an email on a giving day, it is going to raise far more money than if I send that email on any other day <laughs> because um, people have heard about it. Again, you don't have to explain the concept of it to them and um, they're ready to, to give because they've been thinking about it. The day has arrived and they're ready to make their gift. Um, so the return on investment has been um, just absolutely super apparent in um, my experience. Um, I also find it to be a really frictionless way to stay in touch with your broad-based donors. So let's take that calendar year-end example, December. Um, we, those people, we hope they'll give the next December, but we also want to create the opportunity for them to continue supporting your organization throughout the year. And so giving days can often create those sort of posts along the way to keep them engaged, to keep them thinking about your organization and knowing that you need their support. Um, so I think it's a really nice way um, to keep in touch with them. Also with Giving Days, because it is a community of some kind of events, you're, you're bringing some kind of group that has something in common together. I think that it becomes um, maybe a little bit more lighthearted oftentimes. I think the communication can be a little bit um, peppier and fun and cute. And um, so I think that definitely comes into play with Giving Days when and increases the, there's no friction. It's just kind of adorable. <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you use or have you used peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in conjunction with giving days? Um, I have not, actually. I know some about it, and we will actually talk about it. I'm thinking about it. That's why mm -hmm. I just wondered whether that might it would be effective. It's, yes. It, it definitely is a great thing, and if you have the technology to support it, I think it could be really effective for you. Could you just uh, repeat the question that was asked? Oh, yeah. So the question was, have I used peer-to-peer -peer fundraising um, in my giving campaigns? And I have not used them with my giving days to date, but I know enough about them and the potential that I do recommend them. So we'll definitely talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. Um, one of the other things that I have seen with giving days is that major donors will surprise you. Um, they, even though they may make some significant donations to your organization, they're 
people just like the people who give you one hundred dollars gifts and um, they want to be part of something larger too so i've definitely seen some um, many gifts over the year where a major donor wanted to be part of that collective giving day and did something that you weren't expecting whether they just made an additional major gift maybe they made a a small gift to a major donor is oftentimes a sizable gift to our organization, so it creates an opportunity for those gifts. And then um, also matching challenges are something we'll talk about, but they can be great people to put a challenge in front of your base. And then I put the sometimes clause on these things. Um, sometimes these work well. Um, sometimes you end up with Giving Days. Giving Tuesday is a great example. Give Big is a great example where the donor kind of knows what it is. It has brand recognition. They understand the basics of what that means. And so that's really helpful because you have to explain even less. Um, I've definitely seen at the symphony loyalty to the Giving Day. So we have some people that we call in other times of the year and they say, oh no, I make my gift in, in May during Give Big. <laughs> so um, they're very loyal and they enjoy giving that way. Um, and then time of year. So sometimes you can con control the, the time of year that a Giving Day happens and that's always handy. Um, sometimes you can't and sometimes it works really well with your annual plan and um, can really either create a new opportunity to talk to your donor base or um, I, I know, for example, with Give Big, uh, they chose the May time period because that's more of a sort of a cash light time for nonprofits. It's in between cal calendar year ends. And so they felt like that would be helpful to um, assist with cash flow for our organization. And I'm just gonna go uh, back to emphasize one more thing with the frictionless way to stay in touch with a broad-based donor. Um, one of the things that I think is so powerful is that giving days really create an opportunity to ask for additional support from people who have given to you. So they may have given to you a few months ago or six months ago or 12 months ago. Um, but creating the opportunities for people to continue supporting you is really important because um, essentially the more recently someone has given to your organization, the more likely they are to give again. And so the more days and months and years that go by from their last gift, the less likely they are to continue supporting you. So it, it really creates a nice opportunity to stay engaged and keep them um, really enjoying and being an advocate for your organization. Um, so there are some potential challenges. Uh, so bad time of year, uh, maybe you have another priority at that time of year, the giving day that just, um, you think it's not really going to work for you, and it may not. <laughs> um, sometimes it's possible to take a giving day opportunity and that other priority, and if you can combine the messaging, if you can really sync those up and have one priority that you're asking for, that giving day might be able to amplify your um, other initiative, and maybe not. Um, but that's how I would approach it if you were unsure. Um, and then sometimes you just don't have the resources. You don't have the staffing, the time, um, the money to put into a campaign, and um, that's okay. Those, but those are definitely some challenges for being part of a give, giving day. Um, so I, I do think it's important when you're presented with the opportunity to be in a giving day to really think about whether or not you're going to participate and make a decision that's very intentional. Um, some what I consider great reasons to be part of a giving day is if it's a really positive opportunity to bring your supporters together and it can help you meet your funding goals. So I think those are the maybe the two best reasons to be part of one. The not so good reasons are that your board members and your volunteers expect it from you or that other charities are participating and you feel like you have to. So if those are your motivating factors, um, I would consider, and, and if it's maybe not good for your organization because you have another priority that doesn't work, I would consider not participating. And if you feel like you really just have to do something, then you can do the most minimal messaging and put two hours of work in your campaign and be done with it. <laughs> so that is always an option. <laughs> Um, so I have two slides that are about planning for a successful giving day that I think are the most important things for you to consider once you said yes, we're going to do um, a giving day and um, these are the first two decisions that I think you need to, to make. Um, one is to set your financial and your participation goals. And so um, I would say if you've done a giving day before, then you're probably building off of the last one that you participated in. You're maybe hoping to expand your audience a little bit more, expand your funding a little bit more, is what I often see as what our organizations need is to keep growing. Um, if you're a first timer, I would recommend starting small. I would have a relatively small goal and start using that giving day to learn 
to learn about your appeals, about your messaging, about your um, donor family, and start small, grow bigger over time. Um, my only exception to that is, let's say you're head of development and your CEO really are excited about this giving day. They maybe have a new program that they're launching or a new need and a vision that you could actually launch through a giving day or support through a giving day, then you want to set your sights higher. Um, if you have sort of the whole organization galvanizing with you, then I think you can dream bigger. Um, the next thing is then to decide what's your funding priority. So are you going to ask for general support from uh, for your organization? Or are you going to go more on a program-specific basis? Um, I've seen both work really well. Uh, mm -hmm. Program-specific can be handy because it oftentimes has a timeliness attached to it of a very specific outcome. Um, maybe it has some really great visuals or stories to go with it and um, a very specific need that this is going to happen when you make your donation through our giving day. So that's a, I think, um, can work really well. I'll also say at the symphony, um, that is not what we did. Um, we, we tended to go for general support. And that's because um, for us, our, our patrons um, spend the most time with us when they're sitting in their seat listening to the music. And that's what they love so much is the music and the orchestra. And when we talk about music education, they like it but they don't, um, they're not nearly as generous and they don't get on board as much because it has less to do with them. So um, for us, I definitely went toward general support. Um, and then when in doubt, if you're not sure which of these is going to work, if you have the resources to do some A-B testing, do it. The giving days are a really great opportunity because they happen in such a sort of concise time period that you could split your um, patron base and serve one message to one, one message to the other, and really see what actually works, what brings in more support. Um, I really appreciate it about giving days that they create opportunities for testing that can be hard in more established campaigns that we have huge goals to raise and that we can't really take any risks with. Um, so I think with giving days, you have some more flexibility. Um, so we're going to go into some more details on the planning aspects of giving days and communications, but I wanted to take a friendly pause to say, um, let's not overthink this. Um, <laughs> I know. So, it's like my kitchen. I think it's, when you have many tools at your disposal, um, it can sound great, but can also cause you to just stall out in your planning and just kind of feel overwhelmed. This is too much to decide. I'm not sure, so I think I won't do much of it. Um, the truth is, if you can send a four to six sentence email to your patrons about your need for support and how they can help you solve a problem, you're in good shape. So um, let's not overthink all the things that have come. Um, so creating a timeline is really important uh, for a giving day. It could be as short as a couple weeks if you're going to go with a mostly digital campaign. Um, if you're going to do more of a comprehensive campaign, if you're finding that your patrons care about this, and this is a really great opportunity and, and becomes a great need for support, as it certainly became at the symphony, um, that, that for us was a four month timeline as, of when we began planning. Um, there's just a certain number of things that do take more like two months, three months, four months, if you want to incorporate them. So I'll, um, I'll talk about that as we go through some of those options that you have with giving days, and, um, and then we'll get back to some specific timelines at the end. Um, so you wanna think about, you, you've identified what your funding priority, you know, you're going with a specific program or for general support, and so um, time to think about your story. It is really important that donors remain at the center of your story and that you're keeping them as an integral part of whatever it is that you do. Because the truth is that um, we don't do our work, they enable us to do our work. And I think that admitting that to donors and being, being really straightforward with them is what will cause more of them to say, yes, I want to support this um, cause. Well, Megan, that's true with any campaign. It's exactly. Giving, giving days or appeal letters or whatever else you do. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and giving days, these campaigns, they're so much like our other campaigns. Mm -hmm. The difference being that we're pointing them to a specific day versus usually the other campaigns are give right now <laughs> for the yeah. entirety of the campaign. <laughs> but these are just a little bit different um, because of that timing. Um, 
and then you want to uh, provide a peer problem that the donor can solve. So think about that when you get to your story. Um, and then you want to think about who's going to deliver your story. And um, here are some examples that I thought of. Um, the top one is what I go with when I can. So it's the people or the places or the animals that have a real heart connection to your story. Um, it's funny, like animals can't write a direct mail letter, but there are some animal organizations that do use animals to write the direct mail. So. <laughs> That's pretty cute. Um, for us at the symphony, the people would be really the conductor, uh, the orchestra members, the artists that they see when they come to the symphony. Those are the people that they really enjoy hearing from because those are the people who sing. So they have a really strong heart connection to them. And um, for example, this this year with Give Big, it was musicians were delivering that whole story um, for the campaign. You could think about other donors, uh, peer donors, essentially saying, "Hey, would you join me in supporting this orchestra?" Or, supporting this organization. Um, this is what they do, and I think it's really special, and I know you care about this too. Would you join me in supporting the organization? Leadership are useful because they're the most um, sort of authoritative on, uh, they have the most, um, the word is escaping me. They have the most credibility, yes. They can really vouch for exactly what happens with your funds, what are the outcomes in the community, how is this organization run, so they have really great credibility with donors and can be um, helpful in that way. I think program staff are a really great group to use in our appeals, especially if you went with that program specific um, appeal, is that the person who brings that actually coordinates and organizes that program for the community is a really great person to ask for support for it. And then, um, and then of course you have development staff. So sometimes you may have experience with this, getting all those other people involved can really maybe send your, your campaign off track. Um, they don't like what fundraising writing looks like. They have really strong opinions about how you fundraise, which is not what we've asked them to help us with. Um, we've asked them to be the, 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 that voice for us. Um, so if that's really sending you off track, just you can always write it from yourself. And certainly with digital, you don't need a signer at the bottom of most emails. And so it can be just from the organization. Um, so that's something, if these other ideas are really overcomplicating things, you can work with development staff anytime and do the fundraising that's right for your organization. Do you have a question? I was actually coming back to that and wondering, to me, in my experience at least, what the way you have this listed is almost a hierarchy of who the strongest message comes from. Yeah. Um, and not to get negative, but sometimes I've had leaders who say, well, that's a development person's job. Mm. Right, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm. I don't know if that's a comment or a question, mm -hmm. um, but what what do you think? I I haven't seen anyone say, oh, that's their job. I mean, we would always write the letter for them to sign. Understood. But what I get into all the time is, I really don't like this. It's mm -hmm. repetitive. It's, um, I wouldn't, I don't speak like this, it, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And we definitely do try to alter our messaging to fit that voice. But at the same time, you still need to use fundraising best practices. Um, so what I'm starting to do now is really prefacing before I deliver them the message that I want to come from them, I talk to them about best practices. That but repetition is really important and I know this will look a little bit funny but that's that's really what causes people to end up moving to take action um, underlines as uh, doing some italics things like that that's really a fundraising specific um, thing it works it looks a little weird um, but that's why we do it it's because it's really proven scientifically <laughs> um, and I think that will help <laughs> um, on this hierarchy as a hierarchy the only one that I feel like I haven't gotten to test and really know where they land is actually donors and peers. I have a feeling that they would be somewhere in here from a hierarchical standpoint, but I've never tested that. Um, so. Um, so another thing to plan, now you've thought about what your storyline looks like, who's involved, or what kind of voice you're bringing. Um, now I would highly recommend that you consider adding a matching challenge. Um, if you, uh, does everyone know what a matching challenge is? Okay, everyone in the room does. I will talk a little bit about it um, for the online folks. Um, if you've ever listened to public radio, you've heard a matching challenge. When they're in pledge drives, they will say, hey, supporter so-and-so has said that if we can raise this much money this hour, they will give an additional $3,000 mm -hmm. to the radio station. 
um, and they've been around for years, and the truth is that they really, really work. I, I just went through an August um, fiscal year ends campaign for my organization, and any emails, any fundraising we tried at the beginning of the month just really had pretty anemic results. And then we announced a match and challenge on the 19th of August, and then everybody paid attention to us for 12 days straight, and they were very generous, and they did help us meet our goal. Um, so the truth is that they really get someone to get from that point of thinking about making a gift and thinking like, oh yeah, I, I care about them. It really gets them the urgency that they need and the motivation to go ahead and make that gift right at that moment. And it's because it's a great offer for them. Like if my $50 can do $100 of good for the organization, then that feels fantastic. That's a great offer. And so they will often join in. Um, and it really galvanizes their attention. Some examples of matching challenges is you can do a dollar for dollar where every gift, like every dollar you give, this donor is going to match a dollar of your gift. Usually they have a cap, so maybe that's a thousand dollars or fifty thousand or a hundred thousand, but you say once we get to a hundred thousand in total, the match is met, the organization is, has unleashed the whole match from the challenge. Um, I've seen charities do two to one and three to one where um, probably in both directions, but I oftentimes see it where if you will give $1, this donor will give $2 to the organization. So they're doubling or tripling your gift now. And then I've also seen people do goals. So they would say, if we can get to $75,000, this person is going to make a $25,000 gift that gets us to our $100,000 goal. Um, so you can create more tiers to unlock that potential. And then sometimes it's participation. So if 100 people would join us, um, Actually, with radio, I think this is really common. 100 people this hour, then we're going to unlock yeah. 2,000 extra dollars um, for the organization. So there are a lot of ways you can do it. Um, as, as much as it frustrates me from an <laughs> altruistic sense, um, the truth is that these really will benefit you if you consider adding them. And giving days, they're particularly helpful because you have, it just adds to that celebration. Like now we're even more successful because we're also working on this matching challenge together. It gives them a really specific thing to solve that day. How does might it detract from your fundraising? I mean, in other words, we use the, the challenge match pool a lot, mm -hmm. okay, for for give big for our own um, two-day online what we call clickathon, mm -hmm. even for year-end campaigns. Um, does will it get to the point that donors will just come to expect it? So if you send an appeal letter mm -hmm. without a match, people will say, well, I'll just wait until the you know the next matching opportunity. Yeah. I know, I, I just had issues with that. Oh, I do too. I, I've had that, um, I feel that as well, because mm -hmm. I, I feel like um, they're too necessary in some ways to actually raise the money that you need. Um, I have actually not seen, I've, I've not heard many people say, oh, I'm waiting until they're challenged. Like, there might be three people who've said that for a thousand people who didn't. So I'm not too worried about that idea, but I do think you have to consider it. and and with your annual planning, um, make some decisions on that. Is there an amount of time in between or do we want to go through it into this campaign and just not have any challenges? This one will have none of those. Yeah. I don't know. I can give you a funny example. A couple of years ago on Give Big, um, we have a large Chinese community. Mm -hmm. I, I work for Bellevue Schools Foundation. That's K-12 education. And um, we had a match out there that was posted all over WeChat, which is their social media platform that they use. Mm -hmm. And one of them came in and asked a question of the, tr of the trustee who was heading this about, you know, have we made the match yet? And we had made it by noon. And she says, yes. And all of a sudden, the giving just stopped. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was really bizarre. Bad. I mean, it was too bad. Yeah. yeah. So, so then we had to scramble around for a stretch pool. Yeah. So it was like, hmm. Okay, well, that's a really strong example. So you <laughs> might consider actually not having a match on the next time to see what can you do when you're asking for something else, something else is being the motivator for meeting a goal. Maybe you set a goal that doesn't have a match. You let them know, this is how much we need to raise today. Will you join us? And see if something like that would motivate them. Because ultimately, they wanted, they wanted to meet a goal, and they felt like they met the goal that you offered them, and so then, <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's too that's bad. Just, I would yeah, be because, disappointed because, in that. Because hundred dollars is still going to help us, whether it's matched or not. But it was just interesting. Exactly. And so now, Megan, I'm thinking, well, maybe rather than just, you know, throwing all the match money at these online 
because we have our own two-day online thing and we have Giving Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Giving big. I'm, I'm thinking now about taking the um, match money I am currently raising for our two-day clickathon, which is the end of October, and saying, okay, maybe I should divide it up between other parts of the campaign. Possibly I'm, so. You yeah. know, and I, I just I throw that out there because I'd be interested in knowing what you think about that. Saying allocating it some of it for for Clickathon, another for Give Big. I mean, I'm sorry, Giving Tuesday, and then this is the fall campaign, and it, it ends at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And then having another a, a part of it go to the year end, the calendar year uh, end. You could definitely consider <clears throat> that. Um, I don't know. I, but that's why I go back to the idea of your overall goal, telling them what you need as an organization to be healthy and to present your programs. That definitely works. And that's something we see a lot with public radio with our pledge drives, as mm -hmm. they say, we need to raise this much. And until we do, we're going to be talking to you about it. And so you're, you're motivating them with, with a different kind of total that you need to get to, um, but that it's not when the challenge runs out. Unless the challenge was 50% to your goal, in which case when you meet I it, wish. you know. I wish. Another possibility, um, and this was something that developed organically for us uh, several years ago when Give Big became a two-day uh, campaign because of the technology problem. Oh, yes. We all remember it. Uh -huh. um, Yikes. That was something that happened organically. Despite the technology problems, we had, um, that was a year we had a lot of major donors surprise us, where in the days, a few days before the campaigns, we heard that someone wanted to do a $5,000 challenge. That's amazing. Thank you. If we meet the other challenge, we'd be happy to announce your challenge. Um, and then we had someone call on the day of, which I just think in all the chaos, or it felt so chaotic to us, it's kind of surprising. But they called us up and said, hey, we want to do this. And it was a huge challenge. And it was really exciting. So that's another possibility, as you could have if you know that you need to go further, you could consider seeing if you can line up several challenges so that once you meet one, you have a new one to announce. And they can have different goals, too. Um, presumably, they're coming from different donors. Just a quick comment. When people um, ask questions or make comments, if you could I need speak. to repeat it. Oh, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Mostly, if you could just speak towards the webcam, it picks up pretty well. But um, like orienting yourself towards it will help the audio sound clearer. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. So I'm just wondering how often it happens when you have these matching challenges with the goal, how frequently does it happen where the donor makes an offer, or, mm -hmm. you know, but like in your example here, additional twenty five thousand dollars, and the organization doesn't raise the goal? Oh. How often do they actually retract those funds? Well, I so I've never actually had it where we didn't meet the goal. So you either. Um, I mean, first of all, if you have history with the giving day, you have some kind of sense of what your potential is. So that's one, you have information going in. I do remember the year that we had our first $100,000 challenge and I was nervous. I, I felt like, whoa, this is a big deal. We might not make it. Um, I've never heard of a donor retracting a challenge grant. So that's one thing <laughs> um, that, um, because they care about you and they want you to, to do that. But I think rather than saying, oh, we didn't need it, I would think about maybe moving the, move the goalpost. Maybe the day after your giving day, you then email everyone an update to say, yesterday was so awesome. Thank you. We still have this much to go on our challenge grant. So and so donor has said we could have three more days to meet this goal. Would you help us now? So I think it actually creates just further opportunity to keep talking to people. And that's actually what was so beautiful that year where people were coming to us saying, hey, we want to do this, is it gave us another specific reason to send another email. Now we can, <laughs> you know, we have really big news to share. It's it's much more exciting than you know, we're still here, would you would you support us? So it's very exciting and it really creates that kind of um, Kind of traction. So I think, you know, maybe my question is really around the ethics of that. Uh, yeah. Like how, because I, I don't know if it's something that I feel really settled with. If mm -hmm. I know that that donor is going to give those funds anyway, oh. to sort of create this whole like narrative around like we're not going to get this if you don't give. And for me, that just doesn't. It, it feels a little bit like we're not being. Forthright. Forthright. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And I feel like our donors need to trust us. Right. And so for me, that's this whole issue of like, and particularly the words like matching and even implying that like we're not going to get this gift mm -hmm. unless you do this. Yeah. I mean, there, but there are a lot of donors where like for them, their $5,000 gift, if they can, 
if that gift instead of just being a gift can help motivate other people, that really means a lot to them. And those are the people who, you know, they want to see community support for the organization. It's important so that other people are coming forward. Um, so I think with, with the ethics of it, it's funny because I was going to talk about that you need to sort of create a guideline for your organization. Um, so I'll get back to that about like how you approach matching challenges. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about that. But the ethics, um, I mean, I think that's a fair point, and I do think that fundraisers have some mixed feelings about this. Um, you're also, you can also control your messaging so that you don't have to use those words of we're not going to get this money or that's what's at risk. It's about like, so and so has done this, will you join them? Your gift can, I mean, your gift can be doubled is definitely really powerful, um, but I think that it's also more positive than we're not going to get the support also. Yeah, um, I think much more comfortable with the words like, this is a challenge, mm -hmm. like this donor is challenge. Mm -hmm. And Other you can absolutely do that. You can absolutely do that and control that through your messaging. Um, and I think, I mean, I know double your gift, those words, that means a lot to people. That catches their attention and they're motivated by that as a rep based supporter. Um, but also, they're challenging you. Would you join them? Join them today. This is the goal. Those all work as well. So um, you can definitely be careful with your messaging. On the other side of what I think is also an ethics <laughs> thing to think about is thinking about what um, your organization um, is comfortable with and wants to do with matching challenges. So for example, um, at Seattle Symphony, we, um, we felt that because matching challenges, we want to use them to help us grow our donor base. We want it to get, reach higher goals, help us move further down um, toward meeting our goals. Um, we had a policy that all challenge grants needed to also be new or increased support so that um, the challenge that you were putting forward was actually new money. It wasn't just a renewed gift year over year. Um, the only exception that we had to that is that if a donor comes to us and says, hey, I want to make this gift a challenge grant, would you do that? Then you're, you're honoring the donor's intent. Um, but oftentimes we would find ourselves looking at our plan for an upcoming campaign and we would say a matching challenge would really make a big difference here. Um, let's think about who might be willing to put a challenge forward and we would be looking for new support for those. The new donors or somebody who's never um, someone who's who's, who's given, given before. I was say, yeah, I someone can't who's imagine <laughs> asking a new donor for a challenge. No, nope, no. Nope. Someone who, who's given before but they're increasing their support. So they're okay. making an extra stretch gift or they they okay. went from 10,000 last year to $25,000 this year, something like that, okay. where they're increasing as well. So mm -hmm. that, that was our policy and our approach. Um, and I think that is important to think about um, if you haven't done a challenge before or whatnot, how you want to influence your organization and how you want to accept those. All right, so we should keep moving. Peer-to-peer, um, -peer, as promised. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is where a donor can create their own campaign for your organization and um, with their own goals. So I think the most uh, well-known ones are Facebook birthdays are really popular. <laughs> Please raise, you know, help me raise money for this charity I care about. Sometimes people set goals. I think sometimes they don't. It's a little mixed. Um, GoFundMe.com is the other really um, well-known established um, crowdfunding platform. Um, so my thought about peer-to-peer -peer is that basically it's really powerful. Um, I know that, I think it was Washington, D.C. when they introduced peer-to-peer -peer fundraising into their giving day. I'm pretty sure it was a 10% increase year over year. It could have been higher than that, but it was at least a 10% bump in overall revenue and participation. Um, but it does require extra web functionality. So some charities are lucky and actually have peer-to-peer -peer fundraising functionality through your own websites. I've never had that. Um, but here, at least in, in uh, this region with Get Big, our platform that we use does have peer-to-peer uh, -peer offerings as of 2019. Um, so that's where it's totally baked in that they can come to your charity, say, hey, I want to make my own fundraiser, and then I'm going to share that out on my networks. Um, so they're definitely really, um, they're really positive because you're using, you're using a peer voice, um, someone that they know versus an organization that they don't. I think it's a great way to get your organization and mission in front of people that don't know it. Um, a really nice grassroots word of mouth kind of mechanism. Um, but what I wanted to share is that if you can do it, it's really fantastic. It definitely takes some extra time. So you need to start at least a few months out um, because you need to prepare those donors to have some information about your organization, 
content that they can post with, and then you're going to need to service them. You're going to have to answer their questions as they get signed up, as they go along, as they just run into things. Um, so that, I would say two months if you have the technology. If you don't have the technology, it's probably like a four to six to 12 month project to actually get the website functionality that you need. Um, there are more and more vendors every day popping up that provide this kind of service, mm -hmm. but you have to, they're processing donations and things like that. So it's its just quite a bit of a infrastructure. I just want to comment for anyone who didn't attend the June, was it June Austin, June or early July workshop that we did? Um, we did a special workshop on stewarding these smaller gifts. That's also really important to consider when you decide if you're going to do peer to peer or even a giving day because mm -hmm. you want to capture those donors and not have them just be one time wonders. You want to welcome them. There's a whole series of things you can do that mm -hmm. we talked about in that workshop to keep them because donor retention is so important. So, have a watch. It's on YouTube if you're interested. Mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. And that's our so, Facebook is the challenge because they, they really keep right. most of that data private. And so um, kind of a mixed bag there. Yeah. But, but you know, it, it's really, it is powerful though because suddenly you're giving to something that someone that you care about cares about and that can really create, the, be the thing that makes you really care about that organization. It's a really great connector. Um, and then I think this is the last thing on the planning is to think about um, is there an event a literal in-person event associated with my giving day. And I included this because I know um, I heard that um, locally is that some people had their own fundraising event going on near the time of Give Big, uh -huh. and they felt like the two couldn't mesh. On the flip side, you actually have Mary's Place who had their annual fundraising luncheon on the day of Give Big, and it was just a huge day of philanthropy for them. They have 500 or at least 500 people, I think, in person at their philanthropy events, but they also then had a digital appeals going on all day asking for support. Um, so I think um, my, my thoughts on this is that if the two can have similar messaging, then go for it. Go for combining your events. I'm sure that Mary's Place did something like that where they could really have a cohesive message. It applied in person, it applied online, and then you're essentially um, talking to your entire fan base on one day, which is pretty exciting. Um, but if you can't, if, if you don't have that sort of congruence where these two things are just not like one another, they're apples and oranges, um, and there's no pressing need to actually connect the two, then I would recommend for going. So if they don't have a really nice synergy, probably they shouldn't be placed right there in the um, within a few days of each other. Well, we've had success because our um, May luncheon Mm -hmm. uh, the, the lunch in Spring for Schools that raises half of our revenue last year was on the 3rd of May. Yes. So it was like the next Wednesday. But we messaged everybody that didn't make it. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, we had invited, we have 1,000 people. And so the, there were a lot of people who were invited who couldn't come. And, you and know, it's we a had a special way to include them. Yeah. So we did that, and that was successful. That's brilliant. And then that actually made your luncheon even more successful because then you kept talking to those people. And it was a day that they're thinking about giving because they're all, you know, other organizations are talking to them. So I think that's brilliant and that's a really good way to connect them. Um, uh, for me, I've never actually had an event that's right around that time period. There have been some other concerts and concert events, but nothing else. And that's been fine. Um, the thing I also like to think about with events and giving days is whether you can create a stewardship opportunity out of it. For example, if you um, are raising money for a specific purpose during your giving day, well, probably somewhere between a few weeks, a few months, or even six months later, you are the outcome of that program is happening. Maybe all those kids are coming to the hall to play with the orchestra as something that we would do. So then we are going to invite those giving day donors to come see what they accomplished through their donation during the giving day. And that's a really, um, those can be really powerful ways to really invite them in person to come see the outcome of their donation. Always a good thing to do. And we are going to spend more time on stewardship at the end. Um, oh yeah, and this one, identifying your audience. That's really important. <laughs> um, so when it comes to giving days and who you're going to ask to do what, um, I kind of segmented them. Um, the first three are individuals, corporations, and foundations are on the end. Um, so I'll start with them. So. Um, 
corporations and foundations, they if you're hosting your own giving day, great opportunity to get a corporate sponsor for that, or maybe a few corporate and foundation sponsors um, who say that, yes, we're behind this charity and its mission and join us in this day of giving. Um, but these are also great uh, organizations that could consider putting forward a challenge grant. And it's great name recognition for them that they can say, hey, um, let's say Bank of America has put forward a $20,000 challenge grant. Will you join them in supporting the orchestra? So I think that they're um, both good opportunities for those guys. And then back to individuals, um, starting from sort of the outside, going into your closest people, um, your broad-based supporters, your lapsed donors, um, people who sort of casually interact with you, um, they're a little bit the furthest out, and I would be focused on asking them to just make a gift, and that's going to be my ask for them during the campaign. People who are one step closer, they're, um, they've been giving to you multiple years, perhaps they're program recipients, they've benefited from the work that your organization does personally, um, or they're part of an affinity group, uh, maybe a group of employees that interact with your organization, someone who has like a group sort of connection to your organization. I think these are great people to, you definitely want to ask them to make a gift, but you can also invite them to make a peer-to-peer -peer campaign if you're creating one because I think that they have a stronger, a little bit stronger heart connection to you. And then on the very inside with the heart is your board members, your volunteers, and your major donors, people who know so much about you, too much about you. They're great. They still love you. <laughs> um, those people, you definitely, I think they're your best peer-to-peer -peer, um, process. You definitely want to ask them to consider a gift during your giving day. And these are also, I think, where uh, you might have the most success asking for a challenge grant, is that could we have a special gift to put forward as a challenge to the community? And um, I would typically, like on paper, I would say volunteers, maybe not, but actually Seattle Symphony volunteers, they have done a challenge grant for two years in a row. And that was one of their ways to give back to the organization, which was cool. Um, so now we're going to switch over to communications in full because that is the heart of a giving day. It is a 100% usually remote campaign and so communications are what you need. Um, so I think it's important to remind ourselves of what are the channels that we have at our disposal. And I think with giving days people assume it's a pretty much all digital campaign, um, which I disagree with a little bit, but we're going to start with digital. Um, if you can have organizational communications, email, go to your prospects. That's the most sort of, everybody does that. <laughs> it's it's yes. like, keystone of a giving day. Um, I highly recommend doing direct emails to those affiliated groups, the volunteers, the board members. Um, an email directly from yourself or your development director or your CEO talking to them about your giving day that's coming up, the goal that you have. Would you get the word out on social media for us? Um, those emails go a long way. Those are the ones that turn into those like over the transom $500 and $1,000 gifts because that was a participation gift for one of your board members. And that's an amazing gift to be part of your giving day. I also think um, with, with email merge, you can actually do some targeted um, direct emails to some of your mid-level giving, some of your top prospects, maybe people who gave during the giving day last year. Something that looks fairly personal, but that you can do a few hundred at a time. And, um, so you're I talking about taking it out of the constant contact and the mail or whatever. I would do both actually. So I would let them receive the organizational ones, but then I would send one to you directly, well you and a hundred others, that says, Dear Shirley, thank you so much for your support last year. Giving day is coming up on this day. Will you join us again with your gift of this? And um, that's just, uh, it's funny, we see this a lot in political messages, um, but they, they look really simple. They look like a pretty simple email. They don't have a lot of design involved. And those really work because those feel more like a personal message. And so I definitely recommend that if you have a little bit extra bandwidth um, to deploy those. On social media, um, of course, you want to do promoted posts. You can take over your profile spaces and um, videos perform currently the best on social media and so far as engagement and interaction. Um, if you do create a video for a giving day, you, should, you can use it across all your platforms, your emails, website, etc. On your website, you've got the home page. You definitely want to make a big splash there. Uh, you may consider doing a landing page for your giving day. I've done that where we posted updates throughout the day of where we were on the progress. So that's where we could say, at this time, the challenge was announced. At this time, this is where we were at. Mm -hmm. At this time, so that was kind of nice to create, um, create that information 
I don't know if people interacted with it, but we did it. Um, and then you can also do a light box where everybody who visits your page for the day is going to be served up a message about your giving day and would they join in. And then of course, peer to peer campaign. So moving on from digital, um, I, uh, I would just highly recommend considering these channels with your campaign. Um, all the way from direct mail, which is the most unintuitive thing to, if, if it's an online giving day, you're not going to give them a reply device. You're going to say, here's your letter, go online, call us if you have any questions. It, it works because we do PR flickathon, we send postcards. I mean, not everybody opens their email. Exactly. And that's why okay. it's so powerful. Um, I'm also a big fan of postcards because they're very inexpensive and you don't have to open them to see the message. So the person is at least teed to see some art and your logo and something about what you're doing. <laughs> and I think that's really powerful. The year that we added, um, nothing had changed from the year before with our giving day, but we added a single postcard and we almost doubled our donors and we more than doubled the revenue that came in. And I think it is just shows that email is nice and good, but it's too easy to delete all unopened emails and move on with your life. And with print, it gets in the hands of people who unsubscribed from you long ago, people who never did get interested in email, and I think it's just really, really powerful. So if um, the postcard did, that, that was sort of a turning point for me where I said, whoa, this has huge potential. The campaign more than doubled that year, that got everybody's attention. And then we started really investing in our giving day. You can also talk about um, your upcoming giving day in a donor newsletter. You can also report back in the newsletter afterward. Um, if people receive other printed collateral from your organization, for us, they get a program when they come in the building. But if you have other pieces of paper around your org that um, people get, I would recommend talking about your giving day. And, um, and if they come in contact with you in a physical location, think about putting some posters on the wall or some table tents that talk about what's coming up, something that they might see when they're interacting with you on site. Um, with phone calls, um, I've never done texting, so I'm going to stick with calls. Um, but uh, phone calls can definitely be a really positive way to remind people that it's coming up or remind people that the day is here. Um, I've heard some other fundraisers say that they feel like with Give Big, it's a little bit too saturated to make phone calls and they've gotten some negative responses. Um, I haven't really called people on the day of, so I haven't experienced that personally. I have, I have no, I mean, I, I get, I've had quite a few say, well, thank you for the reminder. And that's really wonderful, right? And I was so, going to say, and if you do call them and you don't get them on the phone, definitely leave sure. them a message. Let them know who you are and why you're calling. I think that goes a long way to building trust that we are an organization of people who care about one mission, and I think that you care about it too, so I'm calling you today. So I think it's a really warm touch point, actually, if you leave that voicemail. Um, in person, we talked about events, if you're doing those, and then um, our friends and media have the opportunity to do, you know, KEXP and KUOW, they're talking about it on the air. Um, I've certainly never explored that as a non-media organization. Um, and then TV spots as well. I think those are just, if you're in media or you're a really big organization, <laughs> those might work for you. Um, so now we've talked about channels and what we have in our toolkit. And so I just want to remind us of what we talked about so far. We, we know that we need to identify our goal and what we're asking donors to fund. We need to um, think about what's the story that we're using and who should be delivering that message. Will I have a matching challenge? Will peer-to-peer -peer be part of my campaign? Should my event, uh, giving day be connected to an in-person event? And then, of course, we need to think about what kind of communication plan is actually achievable for the staffing and the resources that we have at hand. So it's always important when you're planning is to know what you can do. Um, and it's OK to stop at less than what you want to do. Most of us do that at every single level of organization size. Um, so we're going to go through a few timelines. Um, this one, whoops. Um, this one is what I would say is probably one of the simplest timelines you could use for a giving day you would be planning to send anywhere from one to three organizational emails. If you're doing at least two emails, um, you would send a save the date somewhere between one and three weeks beforehand. I like doing a save the date because it puts it on people's radar that you are asking them to get involved. And it's a save the date because with most giving days, they're locked down to a day, and so you're not asking them to give now. Um, and then you'll, you'll say, hey, it's time to give. Will you make your gift? 
and if you have time for three emails, then you can send an update in that afternoon that says, hey, there's still time to give. This is where we're at on our goal. The, give them an update of what's going on that day. Um, those emails, the still time to give, uh, we've started adding those to all of our campaigns. So calendar year ends, fiscal year ends. We do a second email in the afternoon, and um, I've been actually really surprised at how much attention that galvanizes. You would think the one in the morning was good, but um, it can really help to give people a reminder. What is the uh, typical profile of your of your donor base? Because you know it's interesting because after I I've done it at nine o'clock at night. You got three hours to go, mm -hmm. but then I'm dealing in this case with young you know parents. And I don't know who you're. It, you know, it's yeah. amazing how much money comes in the last three hours. Interesting. It's just, yeah. So I, I you mentioned you. I think with Giving Days, we've done some, we've done mm -hmm. night owl emails. Have you? But we haven't done those in the other campaigns. We've done more of like a 4 to 6 p.m. kind of thing. Um, yeah, I guess you really have to think about, you know, who your audience is. Because I think some of these people just get on their email after the kids are in bed. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Um, and, you know, we're really connected through devices. <laughs> Thank you, Tech World. And so, yeah, we are checking email all the time now. Um, this is where, if, if you can, I would say please do that direct email to your board, your volunteers, and your staff. Um, it kind of gets everybody excited. And it just it doesn't have to be multiple. It could be just one email if that's all you've got time for. Um, just let them know about the giving day. Get them involved to be part of it. Ask them to tell their friends. Let them know that if they if they hear from a patron who's interested in making a gift, what to do, um, which is usually contact your team. Um, so I think that is really important that you enable your closest people, ambassadors to the organization, to be able to talk about your giving day. And you can definitely, anyone can deploy that message. Um, if you've got time for a couple emails, I probably sent more, no more than two or three in the course of a giving day. So it's not a high volume thing. Um, and you, so you ask them to share with your network and to share with your network, it's a lot easier if you have at least one post on social media talking about your giving day that you can then share out in advance. And that's where, if, you know, if you have the time, talking about it at least one week, if not two weeks before the giving day starts to start getting the word out that it's coming, this is what you're fundraising for, if you're looking for support, um, I think that goes a long way versus waiting till the day of. I think if you can get, get the word out and start laying the groundwork, um, you'll definitely benefit from that extra communication. But this is the kind of plan that if you started planning two to four, four weeks before your giving day, you could achieve this. This could be done. It doesn't have to be fancy and with bells and whistles. If you have a little bit more time, then you can consider adding a matching challenge grant to your communication plan. And if you're adding a challenge grant, um, ideally you're securing that somewhere between two and three months before the giving day so that you have it secured and you can be talking about it from the start of when you talk about your um, of, about your giving day. We have also sometimes done it where we didn't have a challenge secured, so we still start talking about save the date, it's coming, and then we announce the challenge grant once that became um, confirmed with the donor. So you can, um, and that's actually was kind of handy because we said save the date and then we had new news to share. And anytime, anytime you have something new that you can talk to people about, that's really helpful to how effective your communications will be. So in this case, if you've got a matching challenge grant and it's going to be a stretch for you to um, reach that goal, then I would bump up your um, organizational emails. You would send that save the date. Uh, you could do that example I just shared where you save the date, then you announce the challenge, and then you get to your giving day on the day of. And um, definitely recommend doing a get today, and then this is how much we have to go to meet our challenge. Um, that really motivates people to know that, oh, they've made it this far, but they aren't there yet, so I'm going to make my gift now. Um, same thing as before on social media and uh, communication to your network. Um, on social media, if you can do several more posts, I think that can be useful. Um, our social media folks have kind of limited us to how many we do, so we've, we've <laughs> probably done no more than two or three in any campaign, personally. Um, and then this version is where uh, you, you put more into it. You add mail at the end, um, though it actually happens at the beginning. <laughs> um, but uh, like I said earlier, just adding that postcard can be the thing that transforms your campaign. That's certainly what we saw. And I think it's because it just got into the hands of people who otherwise wouldn't have seen the email. I think um, it's incredibly powerful um, to do that. 
over time, once Give Big became something that was a brand name recognition of the symphony and people enjoyed doing it, they were waiting for it, they loved being part of it, then it became a full-blown campaign where we had direct mail to um, both past donors and prospects. We actually ended up doing two postcards in total so that you would have a save the date and then you would have a give on, give on the coming Tuesday um, postcard for them. So it's like a almost like a political reminder, right? We get that flood of postcards right before elections. Um, and then probably at the maximum, we would send probably seven emails in total, like two before the giving day and then up to five on the day of. But that's when it became just a huge campaign for us. So in this example, what time would you recommend for the postcard when should that arrive? Yeah, so the postcard, um, I, think if, I think the year that we added the one, I think that was probably two weeks beforehand. Um, you want it to be at least one week beforehand because you want it to get in their hands before the giving day. But I think if it's your first time doing it, I would try two weeks and see what that kind of save the date does for you. And then, um, and then I got a little bit tired and put my entire stewardship plan on one slide. <laughs> but I also kind of wanted it to all be visible together. Um, with all campaigns, uh, stewardship is really important to be an integral part of your campaign. And unlike my slides, I wouldn't leave it to the end. Um, you want to really start thinking about this when you're planning the full solicitation schedule. And um, with giving days, that's actually one of the things that makes them so special is that stewardship is a little bit easier, instantaneous. You can make a plan around it so that you maybe have volunteers on, you know, waiting on hold to make some phone calls for you. Um, postcard thank yous have been one of the really bright things I've received from some organizations. Um, so it just really becomes kind of fun and exciting and celebratory, and the stewardship can act, absolutely add to that kind of feeling. Um, so for the day of your giving day and the next day, um, you can do recognition on social media. Uh, if you're an organization that can actually name your, your donors and say, hey, thank you, Cheryl, for your gift, that's amazing. I've never had that opportunity, but it's, it has to feel so good if you're Cheryl. Um, you definitely want to send a thank you email to everybody who gave that day and let them know what they achieved and report back of, your, of the collective success. Um, you can also, this is another place where you can do that email merge to people and send direct emails. Um, that was something that we, I have a lot of like past friends and past employees who used to work at the symphony and they moved on, but they got an email that looks like it came from me saying, hey, thank you so much. That was awesome that you gave. And it was short and sweet. And um, they were like, wow, you guys are on your stewardship game. And it was actually just using email merge. So mm -hmm. they weren't um, alone. They were, you know, batched in with 50 other people. But it felt really good. And the fact that Outlook can let us do that is just really wonderful. Um, and then thank you calls are always really nice. And thank you calls can happen immediately. Or maybe you schedule some staff or volunteers to do a sit down calling period a week later or a couple weeks later. later. Um, with over the like next week and month, you definitely want to send your acknowledgement letters. So you need to thank them and give them their actual tax receipt for their gift. Um, but you can consider thank you notes and postcards, continuing those calls. And then the next three to nine months um, is, I think, what's really important because this is, well, it's all important actually, because what happens in the 10 to 15 days after a giving day is pretty formidable. Where if they really felt like their gift made a difference and you acknowledge that they got it, you know, made a difference by giving to your organization, that's really important. But then you can't ignore them for the next three to nine months because you want them to give 12 months later. <laughs> um, you, I definitely recommend wrapping your giving day donors into other stewardship communications that you're, be, that you're doing for all of your annual donors. Um, they're just, they're the same kind of human as your annual donors. So I would include them in your stewardship communications. Um, Invite them, as we talked about earlier, to the program that they funded, or do something special for them that has, has, hey, because you did this, this is what happened, or I would like you to be part of this. Let them as a group experience something together, whether that's a communication or an invitation to an event. And then don't stop asking. Um, invite those people to continue supporting your organization, whether it's for additional one-time gifts, maybe you have a monthly giving program that you'd like them to become a sustaining supporter. I would say anywhere from two to four months after you, um, after they made their giving day gift, they can be ready to make an additional gift to your organization. And like I said earlier, if it's um, the more recently they've given, the more likely they are to give again. And there are actually charts that say it's something like 
there's a, there's a peak like a couple weeks after a gift that if they make another gift that's like that's the really um thing but for me that's a little bit too soon i've never quite had the um quite had the courage to ask someone for a gift a couple weeks after their previous <laughs> gift but there is some science that says you could make it even much sooner and then with your next giving day there are a few things that you want to do extra that's special for this group people who joined you on your last giving day um, you want to give them a couple touch points that indicate that, hey, I know that you joined us a year ago. Our giving day is coming up. We really hope you'll join us again. It really meant so much to us. You want you want to let them know that you recognize that they were part of this before and not just that, like, hey, it's here again and you get the exact same message line as someone who has never given. Um, so I think that's really important. I don't think you need to do it, though, for your entire communication plan. So I think um, at the symphony, we probably just focus on that through print, letting them know like, hey, this is what you did last year. We hope you'll join us again. With our email communications, they got the institutional communications. They didn't have to get like a separate segmented thing that says, would you renew your support today? Um, and that's partially for staffing, but I also think it's just important to get one or two touch points that acknowledge the past gift and acknowledge um, them. And we also have this, um, I've seen this thing where Yes, they gave a year ago, but they also made a recent gift. And so for those people, I'm, I'm not gonna take them out of the campaign because they've shown that they enjoy it and that they like to be part of it. But in their letter, I'm going to acknowledge their recent gift and say, hey, we know you gave recently and we are so um, grateful for that. Our giving day is coming up and it's something you've participated in before. This is the goal and we will love for you to join us um, if you're able to. So um, definitely just tailoring that a little bit to acknowledge that recent gift, I think goes a long way. Did you have a question? No. Nope. Oh, okay. And I think that, yeah, that is it um, for our Giving Day. We didn't talk very much about Giving Tuesday, um, and I would be happy to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I wasn't familiar with it until I Googled it okay. minutes ago. Um, I'm just curious about the timing of it. Is it intended to sort of kick off the end of year? Giving, it probably to... is. It started in New York. Actually, do you know much about the same? Well, it started as a kind of a in the theme of Small Business Day and all the crazy consumer yeah. crazy Monday that goes on in the Black Friday right after Thanksgiving and Black Friday. It was like, okay, we need to be thinking about giving as well as spending mm -hmm. and you know what we're going to get on this huge day of sales. Yeah. Um, and it was a little radical, and then it got more institutionalized as years go by. But it's supposed to be part of the. We are. It's the holiday season, and we need to think about this as well as shopping and being the piece. And yeah. I agree, and that's actually my problem with it is that the timing is is I think so difficult because all of those, there's so many previous things that, that, that precede it that mm -hmm. are all about email marketing. And so people's inboxes are just a disaster. And then you get to Giving Tuesday and it has become international. And so I think the most successful organizations with it um, are international organizations that have huge donor pools. And um, so for me, <laughs> <laughs> it has never been a particularly um, big day of giving. That said, I've used it as a stewardship opportunity and used it as like a thank you. Um, like, you know, it's a Giving Tuesday. Thank you for giving. We really, you know, appreciate your care and support. Um, and that actually always brings in a decent amount of money, several thousand dollars, much more than most emails that say thank you. Um, so there really is something to it. This year I was thinking about adding a small acquisition appeal. Um, because I felt like it's kind of an interjection to my calendar year-end campaign of like renewing gifts. I never felt like it really co was cohesive with those, which is why I turned it into a stewardship touch point. But I was thinking, well, that doesn't at all address people who aren't giving yet. And so I was thinking of sending a couple emails this year and seeing if how that goes, seeing if it brings in much support or if it gets drowned out by the dozens of emails that have already been coming into your inbox. So I think Giving Tuesday is just a little bit tricky because it lacks what is sort of um, happens at more of the organization level or the citywide level, which is this like really nice community experience where you kind of know who these people are. It becomes now it's it's so big that there's not a direct community with them. Um, but that said, all of that said, some charities are raising, I think, a ton of money on Giving Tuesday. Right. So um, it's definitely worth considering. 
and thinking about can you maybe make it part of your calendar year campaign? Does it look different or maybe the same? Um, but I think it's worth trying and just seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in addition to your mm -hmm. yeah. If you decide to do that, um, the Giving Tuesday website has all kinds of tool clicks, messaging, logos, mm -hmm. that if you choose, timelines, et cetera. If you choose to, they, they try to make it easy for you. Yeah. A tricky one. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that others are being very successful with it tells you there's something yeah. there. So, right. Right. yeah. Yeah, I still want to do some more testing with it because since those like single stewardship emails actually were bringing in five to ten thousand dollars, I was like, okay, this is this is good. This is there's something more here, even though I have my own preconceived notions that they're already being bombarded. So, yeah, I, I'd like to explore more. It's called GivingTuesday.org. I think the 92nd Street Y. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think they're the one that came up with it in New York City. And if you Google that, it may have different websites for different years, but you'll get there. Cool.